Hello. Good day to all of you. Yeah, not good morning or good afternoon, good evening, because people are in 28 countries are joining today. We thank you all for joining and sacrificing your Saturday to listen to us. Today, we have an exciting speaker, uh, Wayne Cesar Chef from Trinidad, but uh, he is a naturopathic doctor and he has a lot of credentials and you can read it all on our blog post. So he's going to be telling us what all the different things he has started doing with cocoa and chocolate and a couple of uh, housekeeping rules. Please keep yours on mute and we will be recording this session and we will be sending you the link after uh, the session is over in a couple of days. And please um, be uh, sure to send your feedback. That's what helps us to have more webinars and give you what you need. And uh, you know, in the top of the Zoom button, there's a gallery view and speaker view. So you can customize it how you want to see. So you can put on speaker view so you can see who is speaking. So I think you, you, know, you all must be familiar. And if you have any questions, please, use the chat function put the questions only in the chat that's what we will be monitoring and at the end we will you know first Wayne will be presenting then i'll be presenting some of the things and then we will have half an hour for question and answer session hope you enjoy let's um, pass on the mic to Wayne. thank you Wayne. thank you mrs balu and thank you theresa good morning welcome or good afternoon as you say or good evening depending on where you are watching from and thanks for joining this webinar i'm wayne cesar from cocoa pod chocolate and cocoa pod products in trinidad and tobago wonderful so, so we'll just flow with the punches here and and we'll give the mic to you and let you give your presentation live so welcome to uh, the cocoa pod and to this webinar presented by Coco Town entitled Coco is More Than Chocolate. Actually, this title is very appropriate for what we do here as we're trying to create as many products from Coco as we can. As you can see behind me, and we will show in due course, we have already produced dozens and we intend to continue development and as many more as, as we can imagine and figure out how best to present them. Cocoa is much more than chocolate, and I hope by the time we end this presentation that you would be encouraged to try your own hand at creating more than chocolate bars from this precious bean. Um, but before we go into the actual products, and this is something that I am passionate about because I'm also an alternative practitioner, so the health benefits of cocoa and chocolate are very important to what we do. So we don't only make fantastic tasting products, but all of them are geared towards improving health and taking advantage of the various health benefits of cocoa, of which they are numerous. Dark chocolate and cocoa have been shown to be beneficial for human health in different ways. The polyphenols in cocoa, and there are many, including the ones that we know, the metazantines that are theobromine that we get the name from, and caffeine that everybody seems to worry about. But there are many others like anthocyanidins and proanthocyanidins and the cachetins, epicachetin and cachetin, which are the flavonoids. And they, those have antioxidant properties and show positive effects against several disorders, including cardiovascular, cardiovascular disease, inflammation, and cancer. The cocoa polyphenols induce dilation of the blood vessels of the heart and increase nitric oxide concentrations in the epithelia, that is in the, in this, in the surrounding tissue of the blood vessels and, and the organs. And they increase clumping and stickiness of the blood platelets. They also decrease levels of low density lipoprotein cholesterol and increase HDL cholesterol levels. They're inflammatory, they have inflammatory activity especially against irritable bowel disease and inhibit the growth of various cancer lines, in especially colon cancer due to irritable bowel disease. The dilatory effect of cocoa on blood vessels due to its role in nitric oxide production as a, and as an insulin helper because it helps to get the sugar from the blood into the muscle cells. That leads to better glucose management in diabetics as well as a reduction in blood pressure and protection against dementia and stroke. Research indicates that the cocoa is one of the most beneficial plants due to its abundance of chemical compounds, of which there are about 380 have been identified. These compounds are not 
restricted to the bean, but are contained in the pulp, the bean shells, as well as in the actual cocoa pods. And some of them are psychoactive and act on the brain to improve mood and emotion as well as memory. And that's why people tell you when they eat chocolate, they feel so good. The best way to consume these active and psychoactive compounds is to consume the raw fruit and chew onto the, the, the seeds, which are very bitter. So of course, no one wants to do that. So you have to find ways to turn that bitter taste into something beautiful like chocolate. All uh, right, that, um, that brings us to the philosophy of the Cocoa Pod. I first founded Cocoa Pod as a research and development entity to show the powers that be here, how cocoa can be used to generate income and as a tool for the diversification of the economy away from fossil fuels. Because that's um, a big push now that um, oil prices are dropping and you know oil is becoming less and less abundant and people are diversifying away from fossil fuels. And of course, you know, there have been major push or major effort exerted here to find a, a way to diversify against away from fossil fuel. Because there was a time when cocoa was king in Trinidad. We were once the third or fourth largest supplier of cocoa beans in the world. We used to produce like 30,000 tons in around 1920. Now it's down to about 500 tons. Once we discovered oil, um, our agriculture became like a lost child and most of the plantations have gone into disuse, but the infrastructure is still there and the knowledge is still resident, but it just needs, it's, it's diminishing. The younger practitioners have to get it from the older farmers and so on. And not that many younger families are getting interested in cocoa because, you know, frankly, it's, it's hard to make it a viable and sustainable income from it. So my attempt here was to demonstrate that cocoa was not just about selling beans or even making chocolate, but that there was a vast potential for the development or rather the redevelopment of the cocoa industry. Kind of a dusting off and a reimagine of what a cocoa industry could look like. So the cocoa pot was founded as a sort of mission and it evolved from there. As I dug deeper into what cocoa was really about, I realized that there were thousands of studies done and patents awarded around cocoa. There's like a thousand patents that were awarded in the last decade, but none of them have come from or in the Caribbean for anyone in the Caribbean. So I decided to take on this mantle of trying to improve on what went before in terms of utilizing the cocoa to the full extent of its potential. So it is our philosophy that as much as possible, nothing of the precious fruit be discarded. And we have decided to use as much of it as we can, at least within the limited resources that we have. So we have come up with many ways to use the entire fruit, and we are constantly looking at other ways that we can exploit the health benefits of the plant. So looking at our products, you know, like everyone else working with cocoa, the first reflex is to produce chocolate. But we don't produce just any chocolate. First of all, we don't produce white chocolate because as I mentioned before, we are really focusing on the health benefits of the chocolate. And most of the, the active compounds are in the, in the, not in the cocoa fat, which is what the uh, white chocolate is made from. Uh, we don't make um, milk chocolate either because the caseins and the fat and the milk interfere with or decrease the health benefits. But we do produce raw chocolate, and that's kind of you know the newest fad now, if you want, where we um, we don't even roast the beans after they've been dried, and we can go directly to making chocolate from unroasted beans. Of course, you know we do um, produce um, chocolate from roasted beans. In the process of fermenting, you use quite a bit of um, polyphenols too. In fact, you could lose up to 80% of the polyphenols if you over if you over process the beans at the fermenting stage. So our farmers, with working with our farmers, we try to uh, ferment for as short a time as possible to preserve as much of the polyphenols as possible. And of course, there are varieties of cocoa that require much less fermenting, like Criollo ferments in a much shorter time than Trinitario. But one of these days, we'll be producing chocolate from raw and unfermented cocoa as soon as we figure out how to make it palatable. 
We currently produce four different chocolate bases from four different estates. Three of them are single origin estates. Um, and one of them is from an aggregation of smaller farm holdings that are bound in each other. So they can be um, thought of as a single estate. And our farmer, Richard Cruz, he is the aggregator. So he, he dries and ferments the beans himself from all the estates around him. So that means it's like working with one single estate. And that's the Aripo based chocolate. Of the other three, um, one of them is from the, the Bethany estate in the central area. And that's, that's an organic estate and we produce our Bethany organic chocolate from there. And the other two are from the Northern range. One of them is from an estate close to Montevideo that was previously owned by Richard Cruz himself, but he sold the estate. But we fortunately have accumulated uh, quite a stock of those beans um, which we use to produce exclusively one, one brand of our chocolate. Uh, hopefully we should be getting beans from that estate again. And the other one, of course, is from Grand Rivier, the, the Peters' estate, Lero and Gita Peters, and they won first prize in the 2019 Salon de Chocolat, best beans in the world. And that we use to produce our um, Grand Rivier Grand Cru, which I say is the best chocolate in the world. If it comes from the best beans, it must be the best chocolate. But needless to say, those farmers are some of the best and most experienced cocoa farmers on the island with decades of experience between them. And we can rely on them to go the extra mile to ensure that we get only the best beans that anyone can produce. I mean, they respect tradition, but they're also open to new techniques or ideas that we have come up with and much of which we can't disclose at this time. But we have some exciting ideas work, uh, working with fermenting in different ways. So of course we produce chocolate bars, uh, but we also make bonbon sweets and brownies and chocolate versions of all the sweets that we grew up with in our shop. Um, things like the Benny Balls, which is popular in Tobago, which is a sesame seed ball rolled in sugar normally, but we use chocolate instead of sugar. We make chocolate cone, ch chocolate sugar cake, peanut brittle. And again, with the peanut brittle, instead of sugar, we use chocolate. We produce about, well, over 30 different chocolate bars in two formats, in the 28 gram and 85 gram sizes. Of course, all, all of our bars are intended to be healthy as well as great tasting. So we don't use any additives, any other fats other than cocoa fat. We don't use lecithin, we just use cocoa, organic sugar, and cocoa butter. And that's it. We go to great lengths to produce well-balanced flavor bars using ingredients that are known to improve health, but are also prized for their own flavors like cinnamon. But many of them, or at least some of them, are ingredients that are in there purely for their health benefits, such as Moringa and Guarana. We make our bars from the different base chocolates to suit the flavor of the eventual bar. So we try to match the flavor of the chocolate itself with the flavor that we add into the bar so that they are complementary to each other. The bars are we generally produce 55 or 65 percent and most of them are 65 percent but we also produce limited quantities of, of higher percentage cocoa like our honey sweetened 80 percent and I don't know too many chocolatiers who have figured out how to temper chocolate with honey in it. The Bethany organic 70 percent and our Grand Rivier Grand Cru 70%. And those are specialty bars. But generally, we produce 65% um, chocolate. Well, that's what we do with, with cocoa in terms of making chocolate. But there's so much more to cocoa than chocolate, as this webinar is about. So the health benefits are very important to us, as are the culinary aspects of the chocolate making. So we strive to produce chocolate that encompasses and retains as much as possible the healthy aspects of cocoa, even though we lose a lot of that in simply processing the beans for chocolate making. Since I'm an alternative health practitioner as well, I decided to exploit as much as possible the health benefits of the cocoa plant whilst retaining the fantastic flavor, the actual taste of chocolate. So we decided to make other products from cocoa that may retain more of those benefits and in fact develop what we refer to as cocoa synergy. 
And that is where we peer cocoa products produced by different means together to try and retain as much or as many of the benefits of the raw unprocessed cocoa bean. For example, in our chocolate liqueur production, the extraction is done by alcohol, so the sweetening is done with an aqueous extract of cocoa made into syrup. So we retain both the al alcoholic extract as well as the water extract and then combine them back together into one product, enhancing the flavor as well as the health benefits. We also try to advise our clients to use our various products in this way. So for recipes using our liquor, for example, we, are, we advise that they sweeten it with either our cocoa syrup or our chocolate syrup. That's provided sweetener is called for. Our cookies, for example, are made with cocoa flour. And we'll talk about that later. But we have, when we make the cookies, we add actual chocolate into the recipe and then we hand dip the cookies into chocolate before packaging them. The things that we make in our shop, like the brownies and the cakes and so on, and you can do that at home too, uh, they are made with our cocoa flour, but it can also be sweetened with cocoa syrup or have um, cocoa syrup or chocolate syrup added to the recipe instead of sugar. So you get a sort of double or triple chocolate blast. One of the first um, deviations from the traditional chocolate making was the production of a different spread line of chocolate nut butters and chocolate fruit spreads. Our chocolate spreads, dip and spread as we call them, are a combination of either nut butters with chocolate or fruit compotes with chocolate. We produce about six, six different fruit spreads using popular fruits like mango, pineapple, passion fruit, tamarind, and so on. And for the nut spreads, we use either peanut, sesame, or coconut with chocolate. We don't add any other oils or anything else except for some honey in the sesame spread. The fruit spreads are about 25% chocolate and 75% fruit pulp, while the nut butter spreads are 50%, almost half and half, 50% chocolate and 50% nuts. And if you compare that to the most popular brand of um, chocolate nut butter, they have 85% oil and sugar. So we, that, that's much less healthier than what we, we, what we produce. We brand them not too sweet because we actually working with cocoa and chocolates using the pulp of the cocoa fruit and much less sugar. So now um, we're trying to make a marmalade from the cocoa fruit and make a cocoa and chocolate spread using the pulp of the fruit along with chocolate. Um, another um, of our popular products is our sugar uh, syrups. We looked at the popular uses for chocolate other than bars and realized that chocolate syrup was extremely ubiquitous. But we also realized that the most popular American brand doesn't even use real chocolate. Secret, it's artificially flavored. So we decided to make a proper chocolate syrup as well as cocoa syrup. The base of our syrups is organic sugar from Demerara, Guyana. That's the same sugar we use in our chocolate. But our syrups are not just invert sugar syrup, but are produced by the aqueous extract of the cocoa bean shell to which is added the sugar. Eventually, we intend to create a sweetener from cocoa bean pulp, but we are not quite there yet. In any case, the highly infused cocoa syrups are much healthier to use than plain sugar syrups and are suitable even for diabetics. We make them in the original light and lime varieties, none of which contain any other preservative or ingredient, except of course in the lime variety, which contains rare lime juice, which is good for flavor and for preservation. They have been, clear, they have been compared to honey, both in taste as well as consistency. The chocolate syrups are made from the cocoa syrup, but with the addition of huge amounts of cocoa powder and come as a generic chocolate syrup, similar to what you would buy anywhere else, as well as what we call traditional chocolate syrup, which additionally contains the same spices that we use in our traditional cocoa beverage. That is, you know, cinnamon, clove, ginger, orange peel, and so on. And our drinking chocolate is normally is known here and in the Caribbean as cocoa tea. And of course, we suggest that you sweeten your cocoa tea with either cocoa or chocolate syrup. The chocolate syrup is your real chocoholic. Another of the products we make from the cocoa bean shell, and incidentally, there are only now studies being conducted on the importance of the cocoa bean shell. But we make a range of teas that we call mate de cacao. That's so that we don't confuse that tea with what we call cocoa tea, which as I said, is really hot chocolate. 
the martini cacao is an English style breakfast tea, but you can drink this tea all day long. All the benefits of consuming cocoa are in there as well because the shell contains pretty much all the all the compounds that are contained in the bean, except you know, in different proportions. Like there's a lot less cocoa butter or cocoa fat in the shell than in the in the bean. We make infuser blends of the um, of the cocoa shell tea in either the plain, you know, originally plain cocoa or with dried flower, sorrel flowers or with moringa. And we also make percolator brown, um, grinds of those of the same teas in the original or with cinnamon, sorrel or ginger added. They're great hot, but on a really hot day, you, they can make, be made into a really cool drink sweetened with the lime syrup. That's iced tea with a healthy difference. They are great for health because they contain the polyphenols, the same polyphenols as in the bean. So that brings us to the cocoa flour that I talked about in the making of our cookies. So far, I think there have been people trying to make cocoa flour from cocoa bean shell, but our cocoa flour is actually made from the cocoa bean. Um, once we realized that there was a huge move towards doing gluten-free bacon, we decided to create the flour. But we use the flour either on its own or in some, sometimes in the products that we make, we add some ground cocoa bean shell in it. Again, to do the same idea of cocoa synergy where we use most of the, uh, of the cocoa or we try to introduce back the, the health benefits by combining the parts of the bean that we took apart and then put them back together again. We have used the cocoa bean shell. We have um, for other products, um, I can't discuss how we make the cocoa bean flour, but um, it's gluten-free, it's real cocoa that you can bake with. So you can make a cocoa a chocolate cake with the cocoa flour, and then you can add more chocolate or cocoa powder to it if you really want to overdose on chocolate. We make a varieties of, co of cookies with it, cinnamon, peanut, ginger, and the original variety, but we intend to increase production to increase it, to include as many different varieties as there are demands for. Our brownies, our muffins, our food of the gods, squares, all the stuff that we make in-house are made with cocoa flour. Now that brings us to the beverage line. Part of our development philosophy is the creation or development of new products that we could license to our manufacturers for wholesale production. We really never intended to be a big wholesale producer of any one single product because that will, that will sort of distract us from our development aspects. So, and getting into wholesale manufacturing is completely different from what we are trying to do here. What we'll do is maintain the shops maintain a multiple of products that we create. We franchise the shops, we create bulk chocolate, and then we license some of our unique products to other manufacturers. So two of the products that we knew we would not be producing by ourselves is our cocoa liquor, which we call Esprit de Cacao, and the original chocolate bitters from Trinidad. Our liquor has been described as liquid tiramisu and the best tasting cocoa liquor in the world. And that's because unlike Another popular cocoa liquor is not is actually made from cocoa and not from artificial chocolate flavor, and that goes for our chocolate bitters as well. The cocoa liquor was first was the first product that we licensed to another manufacturer. As mentioned before, our cocoa liquor is made from an alcohol extract of cocoa, sweet and an aqueous extract of cocoa from the cocoa bean shell to give it a really aromatic chocolate flavor that's unmatched in other cocoa liquors. It's a smooth rum-based liquor with 25% alcohol by volume, which is much higher than the traditional um, liqueur percentage. But it's a healthy alcohol product that doesn't give you headaches or hangovers. As, as we mentioned, our focus is always on health. Our bitters contain six different digestive herbs as well as the cocoa to the stomach as described before. Our ability to blend flavors enables enables us to produce a bitter product for digestive purposes that is not bitter and that you can actually take as a shot, as well as using as a flavor enhancer in baking or in cocktails. 
Now that brings us to our skincare line. I'm very excited about the skincare line, maybe more so than our culinary line. Why? Because the health benefits of cocoa are so important because everyone else makes chocolate, but the medicinal aspects of cocoa is only now being investigated or exploited. Our skincare line is based on a micro emulsion of cocoa butter and coconut oil. That is an oil in oil in emulsion, but it's produced without any form of emulsifiers, emulsifying waxes or anything like that. That's another trade secret of how we can do that micro emulsion. Because the two fats from coconut oil and from cocoa butter are very compatible and that forms the base of the line. In our other products that don't use the micro emulsion, we substitute the cocoa butter with actual cocoa so that, for example, our makeup remover or body polish for our foot, our foot scrub and our tooth polish uses various uh, fineness or coarseness of cocoa powder, which are either from milk cocoa powder, from sieve powder through various levels of sieving or from bean shell that we pulverize. The micro emulsion base starts off as a body butter and that's virtually unscented. And then we add various oils and essential oils to create a beard conditioner and a hair and scalp treatment. We created a sunscreen using the natural, the 15 SPF of cocoa butter because cocoa butter has a natural sun protection factor of about 15. And we mix um, microfine zinc oxide with that. We haven't put it on the market yet because we needed to check if it blocks UV radiation. We know that it we know that it blocks UVA radiation, which is carcinogenic, but we don't want to block UVB radiation because that's how we produce vitamin D in the skin. And we know that in these times of viral spread, vitamin D is extremely important, so we don't want to block UVB rays at all. The healing balm is a personal product and is a testament to the healing power of the cocoa butter itself, as well as the oils that we use in it. Um, the same goes for the insect repellent. It's the only repellent that actually repels insects but soothes and heals the skin at the same time. The massage oil has about 33% cocoa butter in it, so they are not only lubricating but they are also healing. And they contain essential oils like lavender and peppermint for soothing or for, heal, uh, for uh, stimulating. I've, about four years ago, I was at a forum for entrepreneurs and somebody asked me if I made a chocolate toothpaste. Well, that got me thinking and I decided to do some research and I found out that actually the extract from the cocoa bean shell is antibiotic and antiseptic and even more so than the phenol and the other chemicals that they use in traditional um, mouthwashes and ours you can swallow. It, so that tooth polish, it, we made a tooth polish as well from sieved cocoa powder in coconut oil. So the entire skincare line is safe to use inside the mouth, on the skin. You can even, they're even edible, but I don't recommend swallowing the healing balm or the insect repellent. Not because they will harm you, but because of the taste. Go look at some of the products. Some of our chocolate bars, as I mentioned, we make about 30 of them. We spoke about the cruise line, we spoke about a repo, spoke about the Grand Riviera line, our Grand Cru. These are, this, this is the cocoa liqueur, the original cocoa um, chocolate bitters. And our Mate de Cacao line. Um, have a bunch of teas that we make. Our dip and spread line, fruit, fruit and nut compotes, fruit compotes with chocolate. The nut butters, here is our peanut butter spread that we jokingly call Nutella killer, coconut and chocolate spread, sesame, chocolate, our syrups, our traditional chocolate syrups, cocoa syrups, this is our lime, that's original. These fantastic cookies, original ginger, 
And here's our skincare line, body butter, beard conditioner, hair treatment, makeup remover, body polish, a fantastic healing balm, insect repellent, available in two sizes. Our massage oils, peppermint, peppermint for stimulating, lavender for soothing, and purely for fun, chocolate, with real chocolate, chocolate massage oil. Think of all the things you can do with it. Peanut brittle, cocoa powder, All right, so I'm back here. We've seen some of the products. I guess it's point in um, running the video of the presentation anymore because basically I, I really said exactly what's in the presentation. So if you like, I can answer any questions from anyone who has questions on either what we do here or any of the individual products. Can't give away any trade secrets, but you know most of what we how they are composed is on the labels anyway. Yeah, somebody is asking, uh, they want to try the bitters. Is it available in the US? No, it's not available in the US. Actually, you know, we set up a production line at the distillery in Barbados. We, we did a 4,000 liter production line. We shipped over the nibs. And then they, there was a lockdown when we have been caught here since that lockdown because our ports are tightly shut. We can't travel in or out. I can get an exemption to leave, but then I can't come back. I mean, not without two week quarantines and tests and all sorts of stuff. So we haven't produced um, large quantities of the bitters yet. We have it in the shop because obviously we, you know, before we submit our, you know, before we scale up production, we do, we go through years of testing. The bitters and the syrup took us years to, um, to formulate and to get right, you know, and that went on. Each batch takes about four to six weeks to produce. So, you know, it's a long, long process because we have to keep adjusting the batches until we get it right. That took several years in consultation with a lot of high profile chefs, sommeliers and so on, all across the world. Um, when we licensed that product, as I said, you know, we had to scale up from our, basically our labs, lab production into huge and bigger and bigger batches until we now can produce uh, 4,000 batches. But that's at a standstill now, although they have asked me at the distillery if we can do it virtually, where I instruct their people over there how to, to do the, the batches. Um, so that may be pretty soon get, get into international distribution. Otherwise you have to come here to get it. Okay, the cup it's worth, I, the, it's worth the flight, but not the two, not the two-week quarantine process. <laughs> do you have the cocoa flower? Do you want to show them how you, they you know? I know you cannot tell the trade secret of the cocoa flower, but can I you show them the? You, I can show you the cocoa flower. It looks just like brown flower. I mean, it's not very appetizing to look at, but I can show you a sample of the cocoa flower if you like. Hold on. So this is a uh, cocoa flower. As I said, it, you know, it's nothing to look at. It's just okay. looks a bit like, but like cocoa powder, but it's not cocoa powder. It contains all the uh, cocoa butter, everything in it, just like the real cocoa bean. Wayne, when I was in Trinidad, you showed me some product that looked like a small, tiny cocoa balls. Wait, it was very tiny, but uh, but it was like small balls. What is that? 
Sorry, what did what did I show you? No, you remember when we had in the meeting in the University of West Indies, uh, the CRC, the mm -hmm. Cocoa Research Center. Um, yes. You had a small thing that looked like a small, tiny balls of, um, you know, like a mustard seed. So like, you know, even tinier than mustard seed. But it was made with the cocoa. Hmm. That was well, like I'll, three, I'll, four I'll years ago. To, I have to go back into the archives to remember what on earth I was showing you. Because, you know, my brain can only think in the present. The past is gone. It's oh. just, because it looks so... It, was, it looked so cool. Like each was tiny little balls. And you said you are making with the melanger. So I forgot the name of it. Sorry, it has been like four years. Mm -hmm. And they were little balls? It looked like a tiny, tiny balls. Like this flower looks like a flower, right? But that had like a individual balls. Mm. Well, I'm going to have to... Okay, I when you look at that, you can send me the information later. I can share yeah, with the yeah, participants. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, something, and will, some... something will come back to mind when I, if I think about it for a while. And I just, from what you describe, I can't even imagine what it was I was showing you. And this was something that we ate, or you know, like, what was it? What, why was I showing it to you? Because you brought few products that you make with the cocoa pod for the meeting, and mm -hmm. that was one of the products. And okay. then I think about it. Yeah, and then somebody is asking, are you adding any other ingredient in the cocoa flour? No, no, no. There is nothing in there. It's 100% cocoa. Nothing is taken in and nothing is taken out. And, and don't, um, don't ask me how I managed to mill a flour out of cocoa beans without melting it into chocolate. That's my secret. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, but they're also asking, are you making it from the pod or beans? But you said it's beans. No, so from, it's the beans. from the beans. We haven't done, we've done research because, you know, I don't like to reinvent the wheel and our lab here is not a big sophisticated thing. It's more like an experimental kitchen. Um, so we don't have mass spectrometers and things like that. But the thing is, those all those studies are done. I can go and find out exactly what is in a cocoa bean because someone else has already done that work. So what you have to do is you go read the thousand studies out there and you figure out what you can do with the data from those studies. You don't really have to, re, re, as I say, reinvent the wheel or repeat the studies yourself. It, the studies are done. But for certain things, like we've been working with bean products with cocoa bean shell for four or five years now. And it's only now that they're doing studies on cocoa bean shell. Because again, you know, they realize that this is a product that's normally just used for fertilizer or other things. And it's very important because those very same uh, biological compounds are in there, but it, it, it wasn't much use for it from a culinary point of view. But now that the medicinal aspects of cocoa are being exploited, they are going to look into every aspect of cocoa. And as I mentioned, in the shell is a pectin-like product, it's probably pectin, that can be used as a coagulant or a thickener. But there, there's probably tons of other stuff in the cocoa bean shell, but we haven't gotten to the bean, the pod, sorry, not the shell. We haven't gotten to using the pod yet, <laughs> you know, but time will, time will come when we will be exploiting compounds out of the cocoa bean pod, because the pod again is only mostly thrown back into the soil as fertilizer. And then somebody is asking, you know, for the small farmers or farmer associations, what is the easy and safe method uh, product that they can make? Because they are saying in some communities there is a high percentage of anemia in the children, and they are eating junk sweets and treats instead of the healthy local made treats. So how do you make something that's enticing to the kids and also healthy at the same time? Well, you know, chocolate is a fantastic product <clears throat> um, because it's a functional food. You can use chocolate, you can eat chocolate almost as a food, but it has so many health benefits. Now, you know. Children today especially, and it's not just children because even you know, older people who have grown up with sugary sweets have transformed their taste towards refined sugars. So they would find that natural products don't taste as good to them. But this is only a question of weaning off of sweets. Uh, my assistant here, my main assistant would bring her kids here when 
they were out of school and so on. When they first came in and they tasted dark chocolate, they were like, oh, a couple of years later, they couldn't eat sweet chocolate, much less sweets. You know, they would, they wanted the darkest chocolate, 80%, no problem. So it's a question of just acquiring a taste fit. Um, yeah, weaning kids off of sweet and refined foods is a seriously great way to improve their health. And they will find that as they go, older, things like dementia, Alzheimer's will disappear because most of the non-communicable diseases we face are from poor diet. If we go back to natural diets using fruit and functional foods like cocoa, there are many other functional foods, turmeric, ginger, and so on. But cocoa is one of the most important ones. It contains so many valuable compounds. And most of, most of our, as I said, our non-communicable diseases like diabetes, um, hypertension, stroke, and various cancers are all due to poor diet and vitamin and lack of vitamin D, of course. I'm a great fan of vitamin D. I push everywhere I go, I talk about vitamin D. And you can get a little vitamin D in cocoa as well, but you know, mm. not enough to make up for lack of sunlight. You have to supplement. Okay. Somebody is asking, uh, you know, they heard the cocoa bean shell has toxic elements. Is it true? Oh, or is it edible? Listen, you're going to hear that vitamin D is toxic too. Anytime there's going to be a pushback against natural foods, you know, the world is turning towards a pill and vaccine based. I don't know what to call it, but you know, where, where is this toxicity coming from? Show me any study that shows that cocoa bean shell is toxic. We consume, I mean, I personally must consume gallons of syrup made from um, cocoa bean shell <laughs> over, over my time and I'm certainly pretty healthy. No, I wouldn't say that I've ever come across what could be toxic in it. You know, there's nothing in the cocoa bean shell that's not in the cocoa bean itself if, and, and in less quantity. As I mentioned, cocoa bean fat, cocoa, um, the fat in cocoa bean is 50 or 55 or even up higher in, in some, of the, some of the beans we get, we can get as high as 65% cocoa fat. It's down to about 15% in the shell, even though it's driven into the shell through roasting. But, you know, the shell contains exactly what's in the bean. Why would it be toxic and the bean not toxic? Um, theobromine is not well tolerated in certain animals, but humans can consume theobromine with, without any problem. And so I, do, I would not agree that there's any toxic compounds in cocoa bean shell. I think they're talking about cadmium because they say there's uh, more cadmium, cadmium in shells. But it well, does, when you extract in tea, have you tested it and see if there is cadmium in the syrup or something? Does it extract? Is, if there is high cadmium levels in the soil, it, it, it will get into the entire cocoa fruit, not in the pulp, in the, in the, in the bean, and in the mm -hmm. shell. So, but the, 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 the question of, of having heavy metals in the soil has to do more with so if there's heavy cadmium wherever you plant the cocoa, it's going to be in the chocolate, in the shell, in the bean, everywhere. So to test it, other than to say that they, are, they do test the soil where cocoa is grown in Trinidad. And that's, listen, cocoa grown in Trinidad has been consumed in Trinidad for over 100 years. No one has ever died from um, cadmium poisoning. But in Europe, they're very stringent about things that you put into your body. They test it for everything. So they will tell you, oh, look, the cocoa that comes from this part of Africa or comes from the Caribbean has high um, cadmium in it. And you know what I say to them? Well, stop using our cocoa. Mm. We, we, we're going to sell it to ourselves. Okay. The other thing you are talking about vitamin D and all, no, sorry, not vitamin D, um, the UVA and UVB and how the skincare products you make blocks only the UVA, you know, um, A and not but that, B. But when you are, go on the internet and do some search, it, it says both of them are carcinogenic. Like it says UVA and UVB, both are bad for your skin. Which one you know, do we go with? UVA rays penetrate deeper into the derma, and that's where you get the carcinogenic effect. UVB rays 
vitamin D is created more in the surface levels. Uh, UVB B rays are not as penetrating, they're different frequency. The carcinogenic rays are UVA and the UVB rays are burning. You can always remember that UVB for burning. You know, nature is kind of a funny thing, or God, if you want to say it so. You know, we create vitamin D in the skin because vitamin D is so essential that nature intended that we could produce it ourselves. We don't have to buy it. We don't have to pick a fruit for it. We don't have to dig a hole for it. We don't have to work for it. We naturally produce it. However, because most of our urban populations are indoors, we don't get enough sun. So you intend to supplement. Now, <coughs> it, there is a control in the body. And I don't even want to go into the various and the myriad control points in the body through vitamin D production. But just looking at the skin, there's a natural control in the skin for how much sunlight you're going to get, how much UVB radiation you get, and it's called sunburn. When you go out in the sun and you take your shirt off and you sit there, you make vitamin D until you have enough, and then your body says it's time to go in the shade because your skin starts to burn. It becomes anodyne. When you touch it, it goes, ow, 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 and you get out of the sun. That's a natural way to to enough sun. So UVB rays are not damaging because they are actually going to cause the anodyne effect, the burning that tells you time to get out of the sun. So you have that natural control over um, excess UVB radiation by the UVB rays themselves creating the burning effect of sunburn. If, and that's why you don't want to use sunscreen. You block UVB rays with sunscreen, but you allow UVB A UV areas to penetrate. So you get the carcinogenic effect, but you block the healing effect. You know, forget the sunscreen, just time the amount of time. Or if you want to use sunscreen, you go out in the sun for an appropriate time. And if you have to stay out longer, then you use sunscreen. But by all means, try not to block UVB radiation. Um. Yeah, a lot of your products are, I know um, it's a proprietary and the patented and everything. I know you cannot share, but if any of the attendees or some people who will be watching, they're not here live, but they'll be watching the later on. If they want to partner with you and then they want to make those products in their countries, will you be open? Of course, um, I am open, as I said, you know, I prefer to be in development rather than in mass production because mass production you know mm -hmm. i always said to myself i want to create the first one and then that's it somebody else could create the hundred thousand copies of it because i would get bored doing the same thing over and over again um somebody sent me a little thing a couple of days ago that basically says you know like if you just do one thing you certainly get bored and the only way that you could open your mind is to always continue to and that's kind of the gist of it, to look at, to you know, keep experimenting and keep trying to do more and more. I think there may be hundreds of things that we can use with the cocoa plant that I haven't even thought of yet or touched on. And if I want to just stop what I'm doing now and just go create one product, you know, I'll, I'll drive myself crazy. So when it comes to manufacturing things in large quantities, I prefer to, you know, hand that over to someone else who would be more equipped to do it. Um, which is what we do with the with the, the liqueur and the um, the bitters production because that requires somebody like a distillery who can you know who produces the alcohol. I couldn't. I wouldn't have even be able to bring that product into the international market as a single entrepreneur working in batch level of you know a few hundred or a few thousand liters. That has to go into a facility that can produce it in huge quantities. So that, that's easy to be licensed. Actually, now what we have been doing and what we'll be doing from next year is franchising the shops. So we will produce certain quantities of things like the nut butter, the chocolate nut butters and the chocolate fruit compots and the syrups and the teas and so on for our shops. We will have enough um, of our factory production for that level. But if we want to do an international branding of one of the products, then we have to hand that over to another manufacturer. So we are open to all sorts of partnerships from actually uh, franchising the, the, shop, the products that we produce for the shops or from licensing a single product for production. 
Okay, somebody is asking, how do you compare your bitters with the Angostura, which is uh, Trinidad is famous for? <laughs> well, you know, we um, we started something on a long time ago called Take a Taste, Make a Face, but that was with our chocolate bitters and the regular Angostura bitters. And, you know, we'd come in here and we'd give them a little sample of each one and ask them to take a little sip and make a face that corresponds to the, what it tastes. And then we juxtapose those. And if, if a picture tells a thousand words, uh, we haven't done it with their cocoa bitters yet, but we have um, clients who have bought ours and theirs and who send us back pictures of them side by side and tell us things like, ooh, yours is so much smoother. Ooh, yours is so much better tasting. Yours tastes like something that you can drink. Yours tastes like medicine. I, you know. Um, yeah, that's a subjective thing. So we invite people to try them both and see what they think. I stand behind my product. I don't know what's in theirs. Yeah, a couple of people are ready to come there, fly and come there as soon as the COVID thing, all the ban is lifted. <laughs> what's that? A couple of people are, you know, waiting for the ban to be lifted so they can yeah. visit you and taste all your products. Ah, <laughs> okay. I'm waiting for the ban to be lifted so I can get the products out there. Anything else you want to add, Wayne? Um, well, nothing more than, you know, for, I would say, um, we, come, we plan to continue developing as many products as we possibly can. And as I said, um, some of them we have already started working with, you know, because we are always in developmental phase and it takes a, a while to get either a balance of flavors, you know, we don't wake up one day and say, oh, let's make this and let's rush into making it. It takes a while to develop those products. So some of them are still in developmental stage. We go through a series of things. We try to, we think of a product and then we try it and then we fail and we pitch it out and we start again. And the, the great thing about trying and failing is that it tells you what works and what doesn't work. Once we get something that's right or that we think is right, then we start doing a scaling up. We go from our little lab-based thing to what I would say is um, maybe consumer level or what you could produce using, um, say, your your smaller machines. And then we do um, what we, you know, we try to scale it up to a much larger, because, you know, it, when you produce something in a small batch, the recipe doesn't naturally always scale up to a large batch and taste the same. So you have to do a proof of concept using, you know, going from making 10 pounds of it to 100 pounds, 1,000 pounds before you make 10,000 pounds of it or 100,000 pounds. Okay, somebody is asking, they experimented with uh, making uh, chocolate syrup, but it ferments and explodes in the bottle. Any tip? Uh, yeah, yeah, well, that's one of the things that try that and you go, oh no, I have, um, I have syrups on without preservative on the shelf here in our testing facility that was made in 2018 and they're still the same way. But yes, we've come up to that. We gotta figure out how to stop the sugar from fermenting. Mm. So that's the trade secret, okay. I think, uh, I don't see any other questions for you. Uh, let me just ask all the audience, uh, the participants, do you have any other question? Otherwise we will switch to the next part of the presentation. So, okay, thank you, Wayne, for your time, but stay. And uh, because after my presentation, if more people have any more questions, I still will come back to you. Okay, so, sure. You know, we have three minutes left, but um, I think I can start now for my part of the presentation. <laughs> Okay, Thank you. Captain, I'll watch you. Okay. Yeah, I'm, gonna... I'm going to share the screen. I cannot share the screen. It's not sharing. sharing, right. But I'm trying to see if I can share and talk at the same time. Yeah. Okay. 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 
Uh, so today I'll be presenting about Cocoa is More Than Chocolate. Um, we have been traveling to different countries. So we have gone to almost like 30 countries now. And whenever we go to different countries, we see what people are doing with cocoa and chocolate. And uh, we try to learn as much as possible because not with chocolate, but the whole plant itself. You know that the biological name or Latin name for coca is Theobroma cacao. It translates to the food of gods. But I say it's not just the food of the gods. Each and every part of the cocoa tree is usable. So it's truly God's gift to mankind. And if you don't believe God, you can substitute with nature. I'm going to say as God, because I believe in God. So here we are going to start with, you know, um, the cocoa. Uh, Wayne uh, presented us what he is doing with the cocoa beans and cocoa shells and other things. But I'm going to touch some of the things that uh, he is not doing because he is doing healthy foods and uh, 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 you know, different way. He's a researcher, but I just collect the information from other people like me when I talk. And what we found out is even the cocoa flowers, like not all the flowers go into pots. So the flowers wilt and fall. But in Mexico, they collect those dried flowers and then use as a topping for chocolate. So even the flowers are edible. Unfortunately, I don't have the sample of the you know, chocolate with the cocoa flour on it. And then, so the cocoa bean as a snack. Uh, yes, we know you, uh, we can make chocolate and nibs and everything, but what some people have done is they use the whole beans uh, as a snack. They first peel the beans uh, by hand, one by one, and then they add some flavors. That's what the Good King Company does. And then there's a company called uh, Brazil, you know, Castana in Brazil. What they do is they took the whole uh, cocoa um, bean with the pulp when it's wet, and then they uh, dehydrate it 10 to 11 times. Again, it's a trade secret. He didn't tell me all the details, but he says he dehydrates several times and then, uh, you know, uh, it becomes a dried fruit and uh, dried uh, with the pulp dries on the uh, cocoa bean. And then he adds some flavors like cinnamon and coconut and everything. And he calls it pastana is so good. So you can try, you know, doing it because the pulp also has a lot of uh, good, uh, you know, um, nutrients for your health. And then the jewelry, the cocoa beans, I have some here that I can show you. See, like this is a cocoa bean necklace. Like when you have the cocoa beans, not all the beans are usable. Sometimes some beans are very flat or unfermented, underfermented. You don't have to waste them. So you can make a, you know, um, jewelry from it. Like, a, you know, this is a necklace and here is an earring and, you know, do that. And also the, even the parts, you can make this jewelry. So these are some of the samples uh, with the bracelets and uh, you know pendants and the necklace. And then the nibs, the, uh, you know the nibs. You can just sell it and then you can promote it. You can use it in smoothies, cereal. You can use it like ice cream topping or as a chocolate topping. And you can sell it to the bin to bar chocolate makers. And then wineries, they like to get the nibs and they want to infuse it. And then you can also make like a um, snack. Um, like there's a lady called Della in Ghana. She makes nib squares called Cocoa Crunch. And she uses the cocoa nibs and sugar syrup with other local ingredients such as uh, ginger, coconut, peanuts, and sesame seeds. And instead of sugar syrup, I think you can also uh, substitute what uh, Wayne is doing with the cocoa syrup. So that will be more healthier snack than having the sugar there. So that's another option. And then um, in uh, Philippines, they sell cocoa nibs as a snack with the, some um, flavors added. And then, you know, Chaco lives in Philippines, they make uh, cacao brittle. And then uh, Creo Brew, they use the uh, the shells, um, uh, no, sorry, the Creo Brew has the cocoa drink with roasted ground and brewed like coffee. 
and they have been doing from uh, for 10 years now and then the cocoa husk you know uh, we know almost like 20 percent of any cocoa bean goes as a husk and it's a lot of waste people ask what do i do with the cocoa husk there is nothing goes waste in a you know, uh, cocoa tree the cocoa husk you can use it as a mulch in your garden and you can use as a husk tea uh, because it is rich in antioxidants and flavonoids that what uh, you know Wayne explained a few minutes ago. And also some people even roast the beans with orange peels or other cinnamon or some other flavors. So it infuses into the tea. And then they use the cocoa husk to decorate the candles. The outside they use like seashells and other things. You can use cocoa husk and then you can uh, paint it. And then some people use it for as a scrub in the cosmetic industry. If you're using as a scrub, you have to make sure you have to make it a fine powder and you know the, you have to look at the ratio because coca husk is also very abrasive. So you have to be very, very careful when you use it for as a scrub. And then people use it for pot puri and that makes a nice smell. And then in Mexico, they use this packaging paper. You can see this one, you know, like a, they made the paper with the husk. And that, that's, a, you know, another way you can use the husk. And then, you know, uh, this is an article uh, we read in uh, Well Tempered. Uh, somebody by name Andre uh, Cavalcanti Banks, he uh, said he's using the cocoa husk to, to, to ripen the cheese. So it infuses the cocoa flavor into the cheese. And um, you know, I think that's a good idea for people who are looking for some other use for the husk. And then uh, we move on to the cocoa pulp. Cocoa pulp, uh, you know, um, there are a lot of places, you know, like in Brazil, they drink the, you know, when it starts fermenting, they make it cacao juice and they drink it. It's not very sweet, but it's very healthy. So every day, just like we drink coffee or tea, they drink cacao juice. But you know, some people in Ecuador, there's a company called Hacienda Palo Santo. What they started doing is they started selling the cacao pulp in a pouch like this. Um, the cacao pulp, what they said, the CCN 51 that they use, it has a very uh, thick pulp and they don't need all the pulp for fermentation. So they found a way to harvest the excess pulp and make into a juice and sell it. And they said it has a shelf life of one year. And then they use that pulp also as a stabilizer in ice cream. You know, when we eat ice cream, uh, they use pectin, uh, you know, and other things. But instead of pectin, they're using cocoa pulp, which is more delicious. And also it gives the more texture to the ice cream. And then they also use it in the yogurt and um, juices and smoothies instead of gelatin because you know gelatin we know it's not an animal product it's not a natural product so the, now with the uh, vegan and vegetarian movement and getting more popular people want to know what is in their food and they want to avoid the food made of uh, gelatin so for them this cocoa pulp is a good alternate and then the jams and jellies that uh, you know Wayne already told us, but they also make the jams in uh, you know Mexico and other countries with the cacao pulp. And uh, you know in um, in Mexico, what they do is they don't ferment in some region, like especially in Tabasco region. They wash the beans and they call it, they dry it and they call it lavado beans, lavado beans, and then. Um, they use the pulp instead of just raining and going as a waste into the field. They use it for jellies and other things. <clears throat> and then they also make cacao juice. Uh, you know, once the fermentation starts, it, it, it used to be available only in Brazil, but now a lot of people have started bottling it and selling it. And also they make uh, vinegars with the cacao juice. So these are the uh, some of the companies that we found in uh, France, Philippines, and other countries. Uh, they, they put different flavors into this, so it makes a nice taste, and uh, you have a lot more varieties to sell. And then uh, the placenta. Uh, you know, the placenta is the one that holds all the beans. Um, 
that one usually is not liked by people because when you put in the fermentation, it reduces the quality of the fermentation and people remove the placenta. But then again, Jeff, you know, Chef Nancy from Mexico, she found a way to use the placenta in a jellies. And then the rind of the cocoa pod, like when you see this one, actually this is a uh, uh, dried, uh, dried cocoa shell, but there's a thick uh, rind you know, around the shell and then the seeds are inside. So what people do is they can take that shell, uh, the rind, what they call, uh, let me see if I can show the picture. Okay. See, this is the- This is Balu? Seed. Yeah. Yeah, well, you wanna stop your screen share so we can see you in the full screen? The, but, okay. Because there are some pictures back and forth. Maybe I can do her, I got switch back and forth. No, but can you see the book now? It's very small in the side of our screen. Oh, we can make it into, okay. You can change the gallery view, but now, okay, one second, let me start. Now we can see. Now you can see? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, see the one, the thick part around the, uh, you know, where she is showing the finger, that's the rind. And these are the, you know, yeah, the rind is on the side, yeah, okay. So you can use the rind for different things. So this is, you show them the book, you know, the, the cover of the book. No, it's too, light, not too bright. No, they cannot read. Okay, this is, uh, you know, written by a chef called Mercedes in Peru. Uh, she has written a whole cookbook. It's in Spanish, unfortunately, I, it's not in English. Um, yeah, okay, okay. So if you look at it, uh, she has written um, the whole book on how to use the rind for different parts. Um, she has a separate, um, you know, she has for, um, she makes the jellies, she makes the salsa, and then uh, she makes the ceviche. Well, can, the, can you see the pictures better now? Here. And we can see you. We can see you, but now the book, is it like too shiny? Can people see the you know, book? Yeah, can they see better? Not now? really, but okay. Not really, but I bet we can find out how they can order the book. Yeah, yeah, I can. You know, we, I bought this book uh, in uh, from you know Chaco Museum of Peru in Lima. They sell the book, but they gave me a complimentary copy. So, but uh, people can uh, I can find out from uh, Chaco Museum of Peru how people can order it, and I can send the email uh, later when we send the email. But what I'm saying is. The, the rind also can be used for making uh, different uh, products. They make, uh, you know, bread, you know, their cookies, um, pasta, a lot of different things she has. Like, she has like about 40 different recipes here. And then, you know, the skin of the cocoa pod. See that... Uh, The skin, the skin is um, really thick. So that goes as a waste usually uh, as a, you know, landfill. But what people in uh, Ecuador, what they do is um, they can cut this and make into a jewelry. They dip it in lacquer in Mexico and make into your hair clips, hair pins, and other kind, you know, like a pendants and other ornaments. And in Africa, they burn this thick pod and uh, make into a black, black soap. So black soap is very expensive and very natural and they use this cocoa pod shells. And then this one is uh, made in Ecuador and they made the nativity scene inside. They cut it open and it's very nice, you know, so you can use it for handicrafts.
and then the I, I got to go back to sharing the screen once again. Okay, see, they also cut the uh, cocoa, uh, the pod into two and dry it and uh, scoop out the rind. And then when it dried, they can use it like a display bowls. Or, or you can use the whole cocoa pod and then lay, dip it in lacquer or varnish, they call it. So it's preserved so the, uh, you know, the bugs don't go to eat it. But again, uh, you can dip it in varnish and you can uh, use it as ornaments. And then when the parts are, you know, not all the uh, parts develop into the full blown parts. There are some parts that wilted. So what they do is, um, can you see it? They make into like a keychain, again with the lacquer. So if you're in a tourist area, um, this will be a good moment for people to take it because they cannot bring the fresh part, but at least they can show people where the cocoa grows and then um, you know where the chocolate is coming from because still a lot of people don't know uh, that chocolate comes from cocoa because it's our part of uh, educating as a chocolate makers we can show them this is where you know that grows and then in uh, philippines again what they did was they did the cocoa pot shells they are converting into char charcoal briquettes for fuel. So people are worried about deforestation and having the uh, cutting the trees for making way for cocoa trees, but it's not bad because you know the cocoa uh, parts, they are taking it out and making it to fuel so they don't have to cut trees for fuel. They can use this. And also usually uh, the cocoa tree grows in a cabruca system, what they call in Brazil, like an intercrop. So it's not complete deforestation. Uh, just monocropping of cocoa is not done in many countries. So there are sometimes there is a negative uh, publicity about uh, cocoa farming, but that's not true. As a chocolate makers, we have to help farmers and also educate the public that the farmers are not destroying the natural trees. And then again, uh, the cocoa part, this is another interesting article uh, I read. Um, in uh, Hanover, they are trying to see, sorry, University of Nottingham, they are trying to see if they can make electricity from the cocoa parts. So if they come up with the, uh, you know, um, they right now it's an interesting site, but if you want more information, here's the uh, link. And when we send the um, uh, link to the uh, video presentation, we will also send you this uh, PowerPoint presentation. So you can click on the link and uh, go and read more about it. It was very interesting. They make synthesis gas and the gas they, you know, that creates carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide and hydrogen, and then they use it to uh, generate electricity. So that will be good for a lot of uh, communities, rural communities where they don't have the electricity or you know, the power supply, they cannot run the electric lines, but they can use the generator to generate their own electricity. That will be another interesting one, but I think it's in the beginning stages. And then we will move on to the cocoa leaves. You know, the cocoa leaves, you know, pe people, you know, uh, prune the trees often, and then it just falls on the floor and it becomes a fertilizer. But then you can also use the cocoa leaves to make like a lampshades and also packing materials. And, and here is the, in the packing box that we got from Brazil about this, uh, we got it in 2013 and it has still stayed good. So they took the cocoa leaf and they made it a box and they made a window with the plastic. So you can, you know, use it like a display box or a gift box and it's all natural and, you know, reduces the packaging cost. Because a lot of times when we have the webinar, even in the last webinar, people were asking, for, uh, you know, what are the solutions for packaging? Because especially under COVID now, the paper is very expensive and a lot of people, even the magazines and the, you know, other people are having a problem printing the things. So you can make, uh, you know, the box are, they also made a paper with a cocoa leaf. 
So this is the cocoa leaf they dried. So uh, they can process it and make it into, uh, you know, they just sometimes wrap the chocolate in here, but uh, there are ways that you can make into a uh, packing paper. And uh, this was, uh, you know, um, there is a company name here. The good thing is they put their uh, company name and uh, their phone number and everything. This is from Brazil. It's a D E M E A D E S dot com dot B R. So if you need more information about this paper, you can reach that company. And then um, the chocolate and coffee. You know, a lot of places where cocoa grows, they also grow coffee. So there are a lot of people that are trying to combine coffee and chocolate. So they are showing, uh, the studies have shown that taking coffee with chocolate increases our concentration and cognitive abilities. So in India, during the exam time, they are uh, you know, promoting uh, coffee and chocolate as a you know, health food or memory booster for the children. And then in US, you know, sometimes they are selling coffee and chocolate as alternate for the five hour energy shots because five hour energy shots, you know, it increases your blood pressure. Sometimes it's not good for your health, whereas coffee and chocolate, all natural ingredients, it's good for you. It's not going to affect you negatively. And then the companies in India, the infusions, M and and chocolates, they all use the coffee and chocolate together. And in Latvia, what they did is they went one more step. Cascara, Cascara is the, the, the dried cherry of the coffee. Because in coffee also, the dried cherry, just like we throw the pulp uh, in the cocoa, they throw the uh, cherries. They use only the seeds for our coffee. But this company, Coffee Pixels, what they did was they found a way to grind the cascara into the chocolate and then they are selling, they are very unique and they are very successful in selling that chocolate. So if you are in a coffee growing country, maybe that's one thing that you should consider. Then other foods from Kuvacher, because a lot of countries, you know, um, where the cocoa grows, uh, unfortunately, there are also infrastructure is less and they don't have access to the power all the time. They don't have access to the cooling and all the other things. So what the, the, you know, there's a company called the 36 Foods in Nigeria. What they did was they wanted to sell the chocolate as an alternate, not in the uh, bar form or truffles, but they are combine, combining the chocolate with the local in, uh, ingredients like a coconut, peanut, cashew, cassava, and they make a called garinola. We know, like a, we call granola with the vote, but the Gary is the another name for tapioca or cassava. So they call it Garinola and they eat as a breakfast. One, that way they are consuming more chocolate and also they don't have to worry about uh, you know, cooling it, transportation is much easier. And they are also using it as a topping in um, yogurt, ice cream, in snack, you know, cookies energy bars and everything. So she came up with the 36 forces for the, there are 36 states in Nigeria. So that's her company. And this is, uh, you know, their slide that we, you know, I got it when I was in uh, Chakova this year. And the Garinola, it was tasting so good. So that's another thing. Always you can mix, you know, chocolate with your uh, local foods and make a healthy alternatives and you can overcome the problems you have in uh, power supply or electricity or other things. So you can make it, uh, you know, more uh, uh, profit and less operating cost by doing this. And then I you know people, you know, somebody is making perfume uh, from cocoa. So he has identified like uh, 29 fruit flavors and 13 aromas in cocoa naturally. And he is uh, extracting it and uh, he is working on it, right? This is uh, you know, another presentation from Chakova where they had 
you know, but the other users of Coco, they had a big webinar and this is from that. And then art with chocolate. Yeah, the chocolate, what happens is there are two, two three things. One, sometimes if the beans are not fermented right or something, you don't want to throw it and how much jewelry you can make. Then the other option you can do is you can grind them. And this is, uh, uh, there's a company called the Clear Charts. And this lady, um, can you see it better? Yeah. So what she, this lady does is so she gets those uh, chocolate, uh, you know, and makes it an art. She draws the pictures of the farmers in different countries that she is visiting and she sells them and gives the, donates the money back to the farmer whose picture is here. So that's another way you can do. So you can make, uh, you know, chocolate as a painting and you can involve children or networking. I know for right now, this year, we could not do any networking because of COVID, but when the things become normal, if you want to bring people together and have fun and you can use the, the wasted chocolate and use it for this uh, painting activities. And then, uh, you know, there are also the other things they do is like a chocolate soap in Nigeria they do with the uh, cocoa butter and also the chocolate. So that's why it's like a bicolor. And you can, um, there are different ways of uh, soaps they make. So it's, uh, you know, um, so as I mentioned, there is uh, nothing goes waste in chocolate or cocoa tree. You can use every part of the cocoa tree that just your imagination and um, your will, you know, um, your dedication to find out the new ways, that's the limit, okay? So you can create employment, you can make the farming sustainable and customers get healthy chocolate. And when people eat chocolate, they're all happy. So you're making a happy world, especially, uh, you know, chocolate helps you to build, you know, immunity and also makes you, um, you know, nutrition makes your body better. So you can fight the COVID or any other thing. So especially today, you need chocolate to keep your spirits soaring. You keep your thoughts positive and make our body stronger. So let's all stay together, you know, stay strong, stay healthy, stay safe. So if you have any questions, you can reach out to uh, me or Wayne. Wayne has a lot more, uh, you know, R&D he has done. But this is only some information I have collected over the years. So feel free to contact us. Yeah. So what I want to um, ask the audience is, have you tried anything else? You know, because you are all in the chocolate field for a long time. Have you done anything unique that you would like to share with the other participants? Please feel free to put it in the chat. Or if you have any questions, we will open it uh, for the questions. Mrs. Balu, it's Teresa. Really quick, can I ask you for those that don't know who you are, you didn't get an introduction. Can you just, for those that registered that may not know Coco Town or know Mrs. Balu, can you tell us who you are? Okay. Okay, sorry. I should have done that. <laughs> okay, my name is Andal okay. Balu. Okay. Uh, I am one of the co-founder of uh, Coco Town with uh, Dr. Balu. The Dr. Balu is the brain behind the company because uh, he uh, makes the machines and uh, he has the patents on our machines. And we have been, uh, you know, I have been in business from 1992. Uh, the original company is called the Inno Concepts. We were just trading company, buying some specialty equipment and selling. And in 2008, when the recession came, we were, had to pivot. And then at that's the time in 2006, I think people uh, started um, making chocolate in small scale. They wanted to do chocolate, uh, but they didn't have the machines. So some people were buying our machines and they were modifying it. And then we asked them, what are you doing? How you make chocolate? 
and then in we took like you know two three years to do our own r d and in 2009 we registered the company name coco town and focusing more on the uh, chocolate related products when we started there were only five uh, companies that were making chocolate they were also in big uh, brands like a dagoba chefron burger and things like that and they were buying the used equipment from europe and refurbishing it and still they had to make uh, like ton of chocolate a day because they are huge machines then we showed people that they can make chocolate in their home in small scale like four kilos five four and a half kilos in a batch and now we are happy to say we have customers in 100 countries we know in coco town we believe in creating chocopreneurs we call like the entrepreneurs in chocolate um, we are not here just to sell the machines we provide them the equipment education and uh, evaluation tools so this uh, because of the covid we could not travel but now we have an opportunity to meet our customers you know um, virtually and uh, you know people like wayne and other panelists they are kind enough to share their knowledge with us to benefit the whole chocolate community so we are here today because of uh, customers our employees and also people like wayne and uh, other panelists we have done about uh, nine uh, there is a nine or eight eight uh, webinars so far so all the panelists we thank you and we have more uh, webinars coming up so keep watching it we are making it uh, available free of cost because we know everybody is hurting and every penny counts in this situation so we will try to help you as much as you can so any help you need we are open you can contact us through email info at cocotown.com or you can find us on skype Facebook. Atirsa is active on Facebook and Instagram for Coco Town, and she will be answering most of your uh, questions. So I want to thank you all for listening and especially uh, for Teresa and Raghavendra, who is uh, communicating with people through emails, uh, you know, sending the links and other things, and Balu, because he's giving the support from behind for all we do, and Gary, all our employees all of our customers.